Hi, welcome to A Grey Barn Rising. I'm sitting here with Bootsy Beagle, and well, she's sitting on me, so we're sitting together. I'm reading the poems this evening of uh, the Argentinian poet, Olga Orozco. Uh, she was born in 1920, and she left the body in 1999. She is a, a fantastical poet, and I use that word not just as a superlative about her work. I mean, she is a fantastic poet, but there's a, a, a dream element to her, almost a kind of fantasia as she goes into the uh, deep interior landscape of her psyche. Uh, there's magic and ritual and, and deep complexity in her um, sense of uh, poetics. I want to begin by reading a poem from an anthology entitled The Invisible Presence, and this is uh, 16 Poets of Spanish America, 1925 to 1995. This, is, this book is translated by Be Beatrice Zeller, and um, I want to read one of Olga Orozco's poems from this anthology, and then I'll read from a book of hers. This is entitled neither dog nor wolf. Is that okay? Okay. Neither dog nor wolf. They shut me into myself. They split me in half. Day by day they breed me inside patience, inside a black creature that roars like the sea. They proceed to cut me out with the scissors of nightmares, and I fall into this world with half my blood on each side, a face carved deep within by the fangs of fury, alone while another face dissolves into the mist of the great herds. Who rules here? I decree the plague, and with my sides ablaze I cross the plains of future and past. I lie down and gnaw at the little bones of all those dreams that died among heavenly pastures. My kingdom is in my shadow, and it follows me wherever I go. It collapses in ruins, leaves the doors open to the invading enemy. Every night I tear with my teeth at the ropes encircling my heart. And dawn finds me with my cage of disobedience on my back. When I devour my God, I wear his face under my mask. But at the fountain of men, I only drink the velvety poison of pity which scrapes at my insides. I have etched the tournament on both sides of the tapestry. I have won my scepter like an animal exposed to the elements, and I have also granted shreds of gentleness as trophies. But who wins in me? And who defends my solitary bastion in the desert? The sheets of dream. Who is gnawing at my lips slowly and in the dark with my own teeth. <laughs> That's just such an intense poem. I wanted to begin with that because it really typifies, typifies the surreal landscape of, a, of an Olga Orozco poem. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of that landscape is interior for her. As her translator, one of her great translators, Mary Crow, has pointed out, one of the things about uh, an Olga Orozco poem is that it's very human, and we get glimpses of her life even as it's cosmic, and even as it moves into other worlds. And speaking of Mary Crow, I wanted to read from her translations now of uh, the poet, and this is from her book, in, uh, Olga Orozco's book, Engravings Torn from Insomnia. Let's go ahead and begin with um, see. Let's begin with this poem entitled Olga Orozco. I, Olga Orozco, tell everyone from your heart I'm dying. 
I loved solitude, the heroic endurance of all faith, leisure where strange animals and fabulous plants grow, the shadow of a great age that moved between mysteries and hallucinations, and also the slight trembling of lamps in the dusk. My story rests in my hands and in the hands of those who tattooed them. From my sojourn, magic and rites remain, and a few anniversaries worn by the gust from a cruel love, distant smoke from the house where we never lived, and gestures scattered among the gestures of people who never knew me. All the rest is still unfolding in oblivion, still carving grief on the face of the woman who sought herself in me, as in a mirror of smiling meadows, the one you'll consider strangely alien, my ghost condemned to my form in this world. She would have liked to regard me with scorn or pride at the last instant like a flash of lightning, not in the confused tomb where I still raise my hoarse voice, tearful, among the whirlwinds of your heart. No, this death admits no rest, no grandeur. I cannot keep looking at it as I have for so long, as if for the first time but I must go on dying until your death, because I am your witness before a law deeper and darker than shifting dreams. There, where we write the sentence, they are already dead. They were chosen for punishment and pardon, for heaven and hell. Now they are a damp spot on the walls of their first home. One of the elements, one of the images that um, Orozco often ref uh, returns to is death. And it's in part a human death, but it's also a psychological uh, breakage that then allows itself to realign itself into something more generative and alive. It's very mystical, almost shamanic in that sense of her relationship with death in these poems. Speaking of death, here's a poem called The Deaths. Look at some dead whose bones the rain will not whiten, tombstones where the stormy blow of lizard skin has never resounded, inscriptions nobody will scan, lighting the light of some tear, sand without footprints in every memory. They are the dead with no flowers. They did not bequeath us letters or wedding rings or portraits. No heroic trophy testifies to their glory of ignominy. Their lives were completed without honor on earth, but their destiny was as explosive as a knife flash. Because they knew neither dreams nor peace, in the infam infamous beds betrayed by happiness, because they only obeyed a law more ardent than the avid drop of brine. That law and no other, that and that alone, that is why their deaths are the exasperated faces of our life. Again, there's that wonderful paradox in her work about death and life and, and how they feed one another. It comes in every storm. And don't you feel also, perhaps, a stormy sorrow on the skin of time? like a scar that opens again there where the sky was uprooted? And don't you feel sometimes how that night gathers its 
tatters into an ominous bird, that there's a beating of wings against the roof, like a clash among immense spring leaves struggling, or of hands clapping to summon you to death. And don't you feel afterwards someone exiled is crying, and there's an ember of a fallen angel on the threshold, brought suddenly, like a beggar, by an alien gust of wind. And don't you feel, like me, that a house rolling toward the abyss runs over you with a crash of crockery shattered by lightning, with two empty shells embracing each other for an endless journey? with a screech of axles suddenly fractured like love's broken promises? And don't you feel then your bed sinking like the nave of a cathedral crushed by the fall of heaven, and that a thick, heavy water runs over your face till the final judgment? Again, it's the slime. Again, your heart thrown into the depth of the pool, prisoner once more among the waves closing a dream. Lie down as I do in this miserable eternity of one day. It's useless to howl. From these waters, the beasts of oblivion don't drink. like to close with um, <clears throat> this poem. In the end was the word. So my words scatter as if they were shadows of shadows that withdraw, billows of wandering smoke exhaled by the wind's mouth, vanishing from my sight behind the doors of silence. They are less than the last lees of a color, than a sigh in the grass, ghosts that don't even resemble the reflection they once were. Won't anything then stay in its place? Won't anything merge with its name from skin to bone? And I, who took cover in words, as if in the folds of revelation, who built worlds of endless visions to put the Garden of Eden on the stones of the Word? Haven't I tried to say all of death's alphabets backwards? Poetry, wasn't that your triumph over the darkness? Each word in the image of another light, in the image of another abyss, each word with its following of constellations, its viper's nest, yet seeking to weave and unweave the universe from its own rib, and to dispense with me even to the last knot. Limitless spaces folded beneath the sign of a wing, intrigues like tatters to let the hallucinatory sigh of the gods pass the other side where mystery is bared, where one by one it casts off successive veils, successive names, without ever reaching the closed heart of the rose. I kept watch encrusted in burning ice, in frosted fire, translating lightning unthreading dynasties of words in a code as indecipherable as that of stars or ants. I looked at words against the light. I saw their dark offspring parade by till the end of the word. I wanted to discover God in transparency. I think in many ways that's such an emblematic poem for Olga Orozco, the power of the word to 
enact the um, the cosmic movements in, in uh, as she says at one point, the constellations, and in uh, something as grounded and intimate as an ant. I love that verticality in her work, that she can move between the galaxies and, and the movements of an ant. And, and I, I really am very much attracted to her writing. I hope you seek her work out. Um, as I mentioned, Mary Crow has translated an entire volume of Olga Orozco's work. And uh, I read from that engravings torn from insomnia. And also Beatrice uh, Zeller has done uh, wonderful, wonderful translations. Um, not an entire collection, but this, these uh, pieces are collected here in uh, The Invisible Presence. Thank you so much for joining Bootsy and me for another episode of A Grey Barn Rising.